Hi, so I'm sure everyone's familiar with these WS2812 um, NeoPixel LED thingies. Um, they're not something I've really had much to do with because most of my permanent installation stuff needs something with yeah, higher brightness, right? Yeah, a wider brightness range, custom layouts, and various other things. And and for permanent installations, I'm yeah a bit suspicious about the long long term quality of um, these things. But I've got a project coming up um, where I'm going to need to drive quite a lot of these. And there are you know lots of solutions out there online at the moment. They tend to be based around the STM um, 32 parts, which I'm not that familiar with. I thought I'd investigating using the PIC 32, which is what I'm used to. I'm aiming to generate at least eight sets of outputs at once, ideally more. Um, so I just started sort of, you know, experimenting and looking um, at various methods of doing this. And these uh, are moderately fiddly to drive because of the timing requirements. Each bit is sent in um, a period of 1.2 microseconds, and whether that bit is a zero or one is determined by whether the signal is high for a quarter of that time or half of that time. So it's 0.3 microseconds or 0.6 microseconds. Now the normal way of thinking about this is, you know, we've got this varying pulse width, so there's various methods, for example, using um, D uh, PWM peripherals. In fact, I've seen one solution um, with a PIC32 using DMA to transfer data to a PWM peripheral, which works fine, but say, that's not scalable over multiple channels, so I want at least eight, if not more, channels. But another way of thinking about this is instead of thinking about pulse widths, if we just think about the sort of window in time so if we actually look at it that way we have basically 0.3 microseconds always high 0.3 where our data appears and then 0.6 microseconds where it's always low now the first thing i tried was just a simple sort of brute force method using dma to transfer transfer pre-formatted data straight to the parallel io ports and the problem with that is of course you've got to do this at 0.3, you know, this 0.3 microsecond interval, and you could possibly get some fairly sneaky tricks to maybe do it so that you can, perhaps using multiple DMA channels running on different timers, so you can do it with 0 0.3, 0 0.3, and 0 0.6. But even so, the jitter was uh, unacceptably high. I didn't actually try running near pixels, but just on the scope, it looked too jittery for me to be sort of confident in that it was going to work. So I abandoned that. A while ago, I came up with a method, method for sending multiple SPI streams over a parallel port using DMA. There's a link down below for the video on that. Watch that if you want a bit more understanding of this. But the, the bottom line of that is that it uses DMA to transfer the data bits to parallel I.O. ports and it uses a PWM peripheral to generate a clock. So once we sort of look at this windowing idea, I was thinking, well, maybe we can adapt that, yeah, that idea of the SPI peripheral. So we're only sending one bit every 1.2 microseconds, and which is certainly achievable with DMA without any significant jitter. So I started thinking, you know, can, is it, would it be feasible to adapt that SPI via DMA technique with a small amount of external gating logic so that we only have to output one bit every 1.2 microseconds and then use PWM peripherals to generate the waveforms to actually gate this so that we generate a high, allow our data through and then, and then the low period. So that will reduce our DMA rate to 800 kilohertz which is entirely manageable. And because this is a 3.3 volt micro and we probably want to generate 5 volt level data for the, um, the LEDs anyway, yeah, we're probably going to want to have a level shifter there anyway. So if we can find a nice sort of 74 HCT device, that will do our level translation, which we need anyway, as well as this gating. And it turns out that a very nice fit for this is a 74 HC157. This is a quad 2 input multiplexer, which also has an enable input, which will globally set all the outputs to, to low so we can use our global enable to generate this low period across all four channels and our two input selection to select between a high for this period and our incoming data so in one 16 pin chip we've got four channels of level shifting and gating for very very little money this is what it looks like in practice this top trace is the output of our spi data so this is yeah so there's one of these for each of the channels we're generating. The next two traces are two PWM waveforms that we're generating from the time that's initiating the DMA. We've got this first, the yellow, which is selecting between a high and our data input, and the second one, which is driving the enable input. So that enable input, when it's high, drives the output low. And so here's our WS2812 formatted data. Now I don't have time to sort of do a nice fully documented example code but I'll just show you the relevant parts on here so if you're interested there should be enough for you to get this going. Um, this is the code that actually generates the data stream um, in a buffer of memory so it takes a, a buffer of 
lead data, one byte per lead, and outputs um, a buffer of data to send to the SPI peripheral. And then our DMA setup, the first DMA channel is outputting the data to the parallel port. I think that's reasonably well commented. And then there's the second channel, which is using the trick which I explained in the last video, where we use the completion interrupt from the first DMA channel to stop the timer by DMAing into the um, timer control register so we get a clean stop without any additional pulses or glitches at the end of the um, cycle. And then there's just a setup of the two um, PWM peripherals. This is using the um, double compare mode in the PIC32. So the, this is our first, this is the AB select input here. So we're generating the height near the beginning of the cycle, ending about a quarter of the way. The, these numbers, but this is a 48 megahertz clock. So that the 1.2 microsecond period is about 60 clock cycles. So we're generating that quarter length pulse from here, from 1 to 16, and the half length enable pulse. This actually overlaps into the next cycle just to get the timings right, because ideally you want to start at 30 and end at 60, but in practice that rolls around, so you actually stop it at 1, and that generates the, um, the timings, which are yeah, pretty much spot on. And the nice thing is, because you're using PWM to generate all the bit timings, there's no jitter at all. Yeah, even if the DMA is slightly jittery, as long as it sets the data up in that window, then you won't see any jitter at all on the output, which um, is quite nice. And this code um, is yeah, completely unoptimized. Uh, this takes approximately 1.2 microseconds per LED, so that'll be you know, 3.6 microseconds per RGB. LED that you're driving in the in the total system, so the total number of LEDs across all the all the um, the ports. So that's sort of fairly reasonable. It's quite a bit less than the, the time it takes to send it out via DMA. Um, yeah, you could optimize optimize this with a bit of loop unrolling, but you um, probably don't really need to in practice. Uh, if, we, if we look at the timings here, this pink line is now a line that goes high while it's doing that calculation of the. Um, bit patterns. This is generating data for 50 RGB LEDs across two ports. Now of course the um, this second this is obviously the output data. Now the output data length is the same regardless of how many ports you're driving but the calculation time will scale linearly by number of ports. This is only driving two ports at the moment so as we increase the number of ports the calculation time is going to start becoming a higher proportion of the overall time. There's a couple of things that we can do to address this. One is that if we know that the calculation time is less than the DMA time we can actually start the DMA once we've done calculated the first few bytes of the SPI data we can actually overlap these two so that um, as long as we make sure that by the time the DMA f is finished, the calculation is finished, we can actually overlay the, these two times to um, get some more efficiency and obviously there's some scope for code optimization as well. And actually I just tried various different optimization levels on the compiler and that's the only one that's any slower at all is O0 and as the free version of PIC32 supports O1, there isn't actually any advantage in the, the, uh, the non-free version. It, this calculation is uh, just as fast. So you know this will work quite happily with the uh, the free version of the um, Big32 compiler. So I was quite pleased that I found a fairly reasonable way of doing this. Um, this is scalable to up to um, 16 outputs, and that's really limited by the width of the I/O port. I, I, you need to check the actual device packages um, and see which devices actually have a full have all 16 outputs available without having to sort of sacrifice some for other functions. But for any other number, yeah, anything from, but it doesn't make sense for one channel, but yeah, it still works. But say up to 16 channels, because you can DMA 16 bits at a time to that uh, parallel port. So you could drive 16 channels of WS2812s from the chip. Plus, in the case of the 16 channels, that would be four external 74HCT157 multiplexers which is not a great deal of cost and that say so that provides your 3.3 to 5 volt level shifting yeah, effectively for, for free.